Good evening, and welcome to this special program on human bear interactions. Uh, like uh, David said, my name is Jessica Kochlone, and I'm officially in my third week as the new executive director of the Shenandoah National Park Trust. No pressure. Um, just a little brief background about me, since for many of you, this is probably the first time um, you've met me. Uh, I came from a nonprofit as the chief development officer of, called Elk Hill. We worked with uh, behavioral and mental health. I've spent the last 15 years in the nonprofit sector, in fundraising in particular, generally working for youth development organizations. I've been in physical health, um, mental health, and education. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm going to kick it over to Pat Kinney, uh, the superintendent of the National Park. I think I pronounced your last name wrong. Sorry, Pat. No, thank you, Jessica. Um, you know, we're really fortunate at Shenandoah National Park to have such a great philanthropic partner in the Shenandoah National Park Trust. Um, they allow us through their efforts of raising dollars and from the support of folks like you uh, to do projects that we cannot get done without that, that support. So um, again, you know, as a park in the national park system, we're very fortunate to have such a great partner. Um, I guess just to, from a community standpoint, um, I'm relatively new as well. I came to Shenandoah National Park. Uh, I've had a long career with the Park Service bouncing around, but I came here last October, uh, really getting to know this area. And I'm really fortunate to have landed in a park that has great employees. And you're gonna hear from one of them tonight. Uh, Rolf is the head of our wildlife program, our terrestrial wildlife program in the park. He is passionate about what he does for a living. He is passionate about Shenandoah National Park. He is passionate about the National Park Service mission. You know, in his role, he plays a really critical part of managing resources for future generations, which is about what the National Park Service is about. And so we're really lucky um, to have somebody like Rolf in our, of his caliber on our team at the park. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy the program. He's gonna give you a good overview of what's going on with bears and human interactions in the park. It's a critical issue that we need to continue to manage. And we're really fortunate to have somebody like Rolf to help lead that way. So take it away, Rolf. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you Pat. It's very nice. Appreciate the introduction. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, let's see, share. And go to that. Let's start it where we need to be, right? Okay. Well, um, if you want to just do a quick full screen, that would be full screen. Yep. Yeah. So, let's see this one oh, presentation mode. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. As Pat mentioned, um, uh, I'm I'm the biologist here at Shenandoah National Park that deals with human bear interactions. Uh, in addition to those duties, uh, I also work with um, uh, the Forest in Insect and Disease Program, and the trust also funds parts of that program that deal with uh, hemlock woolly adelgid suppression and emerald ash borer suppression. So I appreciate uh, the, the support from the trust for those projects as well. Uh, in addition to the human black bear work, I've in, been involved with some of the peregrine falcon restoration work over the years. So that's, that's been some of the more interesting uh, projects that I've worked on over the years. But today we'll talk about, or this evening we'll talk about our human interactions program and um, We'll just kind of get right into it here. So the park bear population is roughly, is estimated at roughly 400 to 600 animals. That's based on research from the late 80s, early 90s, and also hunter harvest records from the uh, State Wildlife Resources Division. Black bears are highly opportunistic omnivores, as you probably know. Um, they eat about 85% uh, of their diet is, is of, of vegetative material. Um, they're very intelligent. They exhibit learned behavior. Uh, from some of the behavior that we saw back in 2016, we had a, an animal that figured out how to enter uh, unlocked car doors. And from Yosemite's experience over the last 25, 30 years, they have animals, they have black bears there that can enter locked cars. So they're, they're extremely intelligent animals. Um, they have an excellent sense of smell. Uh, scientists estimate that their sense of smell is probably seven times uh, more acute than that of a bloodhound. 
that sense of smell sometimes gets them in trouble, unfortunately, with human food and, and uh, trash that's left out. Uh, as far as this, the park goes, this Shenandoah goes, we average about 1.4 million visitors over the last five years or so. Although last year we saw 1.6 million visitors, probably largely due to the pandemic. Um, the park size is roughly 300 square miles. So that if that's about 400 to 600 animals, that's about upwards of two bears per square mile. That's a lot of bears that rivals the Smokies. Uh, that were one of the, probably the most, one of the most dense bear parks, black bear parks in the East. Um, we average over 150 nuisance bear incidents per year. That includes hazing events, bear jams, persistent animals. Um, we average about four food condition bears uh, getting captured and relocated to other parts of the park every year. Um, and we average about 20 bear vehicle collisions per year. About half of those are mortalities. And the problem is, as I alluded to, is, is humans and bears. It's, it's unsecured food in campgrounds and picnic areas. Bears are extremely opportunistic. This is a bear going to great lengths trying to find food. And this is at the Lands Run parking lot in the North District. And this bear is on top of a motorcycle trying to find food in this motorcycle saddlebags. Um, you know, bears, when they're on the move trying to find food, it puts them at greater risk of getting struck by a vehicle. Unfortunately, we see that in this park. Additionally, um, bears routinely try to get into trash cans and dumpsters. For the most part, our dumpsters and our trash receptacles are bear resistant. Some of them are not. Some of them uh, in our uh, concessions facilities, a few of them out there are still not, um, or they're close to being bear resistant. In this case, you can see a bear trying to get to trash in an old style trash can. Some of our problem areas are picnic areas and campgrounds. And we see this occasionally on high use weekends. We see this type of thing as well. People going for hikes, they set up their picnic, they go for a hike, they leave all this stuff out, food. Um, this is, looks like ribs, um, watermelon. Those are huge scent attractants for bears. Um, they key in on that. They can smell upwards of, they can smell this sort of thing upwards of a mile away. Campgrounds, similar situations. People not being able to get bags into dumpsters. And that's something we struggle with, but also other national parks struggle with. Um, this is fairly routine on high use weekends. Again, people abandoning their, their campsite and going for a hike or going on, for a trip somewhere and then leaving it for three hours. They're leaving food out and that's a recipe for disaster with day active black bears in campgrounds. Here, they've decided to put a screened in tent around their food. That's not gonna stop a black bear. There's ice, I see three coolers right there. And you know, this sort of thing, you've got trash out, you've got food out, you've got dog food, you've got everything going on here. So if we're tallying and, and sort of summarizing some of our uh, human bear uh, incidents and, and some of those interactions, this is, what, this is what the incidents have looked like over the last eight years. Um, in 2016, we saw a big spike, largely due to uh, a large fire in the South District that caused bears to, to be on the move more, push into developed areas more. It was also a poor natural foods year. So soft mast, that's the, the foods they find during the growing season, and hard mast, what they find in the fall, acorns, things like that. The, both of those were suppressed, and as a result, bears were on the move. They were getting into trouble. They were getting struck by vehicles. So we saw a lot more uh, human bear conflicts that year. And in 2019, uh, we saw a, a fair number as well. Last year, we, we got a break because of the pandemic, and that's a tiny silver lining from the pandemic. But the park was closed for two months in the early spring, and I think that gave the bears a break in terms of pressure from humans and, and food and trash that was unsecured. So we saw fewer food condition bears last year. We also believe some of those bears probably pushed to lower elevations as a result of sort of inconsistent natural foods. So we didn't see as many bears in the high elevations and along Skyline Drive last year. So this kind of tracks with the bear incidents. These are food rewards. Lots of those in 2016, we saw lots in 2019. 2019, we saw a lot of repeat offenders. Motor vehicle accidents over the last five years, you can see they've really spiked. Last year, we got a break. 
that again, that's that goes back to the pandemic, we think, and fewer food conditioned animals, fewer habituated animals along the drive corridor. Habituated basically means an animal has a lower fear of humans. Uh, food condition means that animal is associating with uh, humans with food, uh, humans with uh, human use areas and food areas. So it's just summarizing our program. I know this is a lot of text here. It's our program is multifaceted. It deals with prevention. It deals with interventions and management. Um, but the trust's help comes in the form of two dedicated bear techs, um, bear technicians, and they're sort of the core of our field season. Uh, around those bear techs, we'll put interns and we'll put volunteers and we'll put people that pick up trash. And then we have other park staff, including law enforcement <clears throat> and maintenance and interp and fee staff that work in campgrounds uh, that really help with all these types of things, these preventive measures, like picking up trash and storing food and doing um, um, food impoundments in campgrounds, uh, dealing with Park, uh, dealing with bear jams. We'll talk a little bit about bear jams later on. Uh, and, and, the, and the technicians, they do aversive conditioning along with our law enforcement staff, and they assist with trapping and relocation of food conditioned animals. Uh, so they're a, big, they're a big help and we appreciate that support. Um, if you talk to most parks, national parks that have human black bear problems, um, they, they can point to two things typically. It's unsecured trash and improper food storage. And we are no different. Those are the two biggest things we struggle with. And to some extent, the third thing would be um, approach distance and uh, people trying to pho photograph or approach wildlife too closely. Bears, in this case, uh, we're talking about bears, uh, but also deer. <clears throat> um, we do a lot of preventive measures. Um, including bear resistant dumpsters and, and food storage lockers. Those are some of the infrastructure things, but we do a lot of um, Facebook posts and get a lot of web content out there. We try really hard during the field season, during the growing season uh, to make sure we get those messages, those timely messages out there to folks about storing your food properly, slowing down on Skyline Drive to make sure that you don't hit bear and deer, those types of messages. And we try to make sure that they're relevant and timely. <clears throat> Um, let's see what else we got. And, and of course, timely reporting is very important. So we implemented in 2008, a wildlife hotline and an online reporting site where staff and some cooperators can log um, bear incidents, uh, either that already have happened, typically that already have happened. Uh, if it's an emergent situation, folks are instructed to radio or call dispatch, and then we, we get folks out to those those situations. But in this case, timely reporting is essential. So we have a reporting system where we can track patterns of bears and bear behavior, defensive behavior. Uh, we can do trail closures and hut closures if we need to. And this is how we make our decisions. So a little bit about habituation. I mentioned it before. We don't have to belabor it. But basically, it's a gradual loss of fear uh, uh, with humans from when we're talking about black bear. We'll see this type of behavior, you know, uh, an animal at 50 yards away in, in around big meadows, and then an animal becomes uh, more tolerant of humans. And you'll see an animal foraging for natural foods along Skyline Drive. And um, it's natural foods, but they just tolerate humans. And this food corridor along the Skyline Drive is is, uh, is a great food source for bear and deer. So that's why we see, at least sometimes of the year, we'll see uh, large numbers of bear in certain hotspots along the drive because there's good food. And then we'll gradually see this type of thing. It's, again, it's naturally foraging, but it's, it's much too close to, to humans and to campgrounds and picnic areas. So in these cases, we'll use a, a tool, a strategy called aversive conditioning. It's a type of hazing. And in this case, uh, we are seeing food condition behavior, an animal trying to get up in the back of a Cushman uh, that Delaware North operates, and some property damage, the back of a truck, damage to an old style dumpster. These in the meantime have been corrected, but a bear breached this dumpster. And, and bears, of course, getting into your picnic equipment, destroying picnic equipment and camping equipment. 
it's, it's it happens. But we want to avoid it, and uh, we we use tools to do that. Um, of course, we use education and preventive measures. But if if those fail, we do use um, uh, things like aversive conditioning tools, and we use paintball guns. We use uh, portable air horns, projectile noisemakers, bird bangers, uh, beanbag rounds, all less than lethal. So we're using noise stimuli and painful stimuli. Here's a situation where we have two of the bear techs from I think 2017 pushing a food conditioned, well, in this case, it's a, looks like it's a food tolerant black bear out of the Loft Mountain Campground using two different tools. And it's pretty effective. You launch this, this um, projectile noisemaker over the bear, makes a loud noise, that bear comes down out of a tree and then a couple paintball rounds just keeps the bear moving. And once the bear's into the back country and away from the campground, that's when we stop the hazing. The animal knows that it's in a safe zone, it's away from the campground and, and that's when we stop. So uh, it's, it's, we call it the 50 yard rule. We stop hazing 50 yards beyond the boundary of our developed area. So talking about bear jams, so David, did we get any results back from those survey questions we asked in the chat boxes? We yeah, we did indeed. So we asked you all, have you ever been in a bear jam? We'll explain kind of what that is. Maybe explain that first, Ralph, actually. So not just in Shenandoah, but in a lot of parks, you can get into wildlife jams. Um, it's just a situation where an animal will be lingering around or along the road corridor or crossing the road, and then we get a, a backup of cars. And unfortunately, the park Skyline Drive is so windy, it, it can become a real hazard. Um, so we, we, we're real concerned, um, you know, with that type of thing. So we oh. received about 41% uh, of you said, yes, you have been in a bear jam. And wow. 59% okay. of you, 59% uh, of you have never been. Wow. So the net just shows how common they are in Shenandoah. Last year, there weren't that many, and we think that was partly due to re initial reduced visitation due to the pandemic, but, um, but I had no idea it was that high. So that's really cool. This informal survey is, is really quite neat. Um, great. Let's see if we can advance. What are the other questions we got here, David? Well, the next one is about uh, distance. So viewing distance from bears. Um, so okay. if we wanted to, yeah, we can address that one in a moment. Okay. Should I close this? Uh, go ahead. Can you advance your? Yeah, I think so. Screen? Okay. Yeah. Let's see here. Stop share. Uh, you can continue share just uh, just the next slide on your presentation. Whoops. We can we can reload it too if you need. So if you want to just share the screen again. Are we back, David? Uh, well, we can see you, but if you just share your screen again like you did at the beginning. Okay. Stand by. No problem. Still working out all these bugs. Getting familiar. Great. Yeah, and just full screen and then uh, we're we're back. Okay, thank you. You got it. Should have ran through that a little more, huh? Practice that one a little more. Okay. Hey, hey um, David, this is Pat. Sorry, Rolf, to interrupt, but David, ahead. the 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 hosts sharing your poll results results are covering up the slides. Just wanted you to be aware. Got of it. it. We'll go okay. ahead and thank it you, out. Pat. And just let me know when we're good to go. We should be good to go. Okay. So <clears throat> bear jams are pretty routine in Shenandoah National Park and, and deer jams to some extent. <clears throat> so this is the type of thing you'll see. You can see people out of kind of out of the car, um, trying to photograph, trying to take video. But this is a situation, this is a, this is a great picture. I think one of our staff members took at one point. This, is, this sort of underscores the safety issues associated with bear jams, not just from the bears and the humans, but it, Again, Skyline Drive is a windy parkway, 
and you've got people in the roadway, many times you have cars in both lanes, blocking both lanes. In this case, at least the people have pulled off the road. But in many cases, you have a rock wall or you have a cliff on one side. And it's a very narrow roadway, and it makes it really difficult to manage humans, the, the visitors, and, and the wildlife. So it's really tricky. So when our bear techs come up on a bear jam or when our law enforcement staff come up, we always try to manage the visitors, the cars, the motorists, try to get them safely off the side of the road or, or moved along. And then we'll go ahead and push those bears into a more safe area. So that's kind of how we manage bear jams. But uh, it, in any given year, we can, we can be inundated with bear jams. And typically June and July is when we see the most. So safe viewing distances. Um, how, what was the percentage of folks that um, guessed um, correctly for the uh, our, our, our safe viewing distance for bears, David? Yeah, so majority of people said over 50 yards. Uh, which okay. is good, but the correct answer is 100 yards, uh, which majority of people, 45% of folks answered correctly. Well, it's, it, for, for Shenandoah, it's 50. So it, oh, it's 50. It, it is 50 for Shenandoah and, and parks of yeah. different parks of area that it's not, it's not uniform across all park units because different parks and d different species of bears it, it varies but in our in our case it's 50 yards so that's that's sort of what i was looking for with that with that quiz question but it's true 50 or more is, is is what we're really aiming at that's true so in a situation like this this is in matthew's arm campground i think in uh 20 2009 maybe um this is when a sow this is a habituated sow with two cubs enters the campground and these people are unaware and, and they're already within 50 yards. So in that situation, maybe you, maybe you notify a ranger, uh, maybe you hit the car horn or you, you, just, you just wait till that animal moves along. But I would tell a ranger in this situation at a minimum. So this is fairly common uh, in, in, in quieter campgrounds like Matthew's Arm. So this was a... Um, this was a media campaign aimed at trying to make it easier for people to understand uh, wild, safe wildlife distances. Um, so this was a push in 2017, I think, by the Park Service. And we were one of the pilot, pilot parks for this initiative. So we got these cool posters made and we've, we put these occasionally in areas like Big Meadows picnic area and campground, sometimes in the Big Meadows itself. So it's very helpful. It shows basically how far uh, 50 yards is in this case, it's it's four school bus school bus lengths. I like some of the taglines like distance makes the heart grow fonder. So just getting back to prevention, in this case, you know, this is key. Uh, this is people getting ready to sign up to to you know enter the campground and they're having to acknowledge and sign that they're going to store their food properly. And we're, you know, you're entering bear country and they actually have to sign two places. So um, that's, that's a big part of it, making those, making those direct contacts with folks. That's huge. And we do that with our own staff, with natural resource staff, with law enforcement, with Interp. I think some of those direct contacts with people are, are some of the best learning experiences um, that, that we can sort of impart on folks. And here's some things we use in picnic areas. Basically, store your food properly, dispose of your trash, don't feed wildlife, give them space. And then we will impound food left out by campers. Um, that's pretty typical. We see that on high use weekends in, um, in, in some of our higher use campgrounds. There's a situation where this site, about half the sites, the campsites in the park have food storage lockers. That's what this is. And it's not being used. So they left their coolers out, they left trash out, but they didn't put it in the food storage locker. So it's, that's, it's just a bit of laziness right there. And, um, you know, that's why we put them there. And, and the trust has supported food storage locker purchases in the past. So we very much appreciate that. They, they purchased about 100 of them, I think, three years ago. So I think we're up to about 230, 240 food storage lockers park wide now. We're working on trying to get food storage lockers at nearly every campsite. And if, and if folks don't comply, or if they have an especially egregious sloppy site, 
uh, then they get cited and, and that does happen. But typically we, we rely on education and sometimes we'll, we'll impound and we'll move food. So our staff and maintenance staff and others pick up a lot of trash, a lot of unsecured trash bags, trash that raccoons and bears sometimes get into. Lots of times raccoons will strew, strew trash that's left out, bags that's left out, and it makes it more tempting for bears to come in, creates more of a scent attracting. Here's a volunteer picking up cucumber salad in one of our picnic areas. Why folks think it's a good idea to throw leftover picnic food out for bears and deer or whatever, I, I don't understand, but that's pretty common, especially seems like on holiday weekends, 4th of July. And it leads to food conditioned animals, of course, and that's what we don't want. One of the, I think one of the most effective signs that we have are the kind of signs that are mounted on picnic tables that are sort of those important reminders and time and space when people are getting ready to grill and, and put food out on the picnic table. So this is a good little reminder that just is in the right spot at the right time. It also talks about keeping a clean uh, fire ring and not using it as a trash can. And in backcountry areas, we do have problems with bears occasionally. This was a, a food condition animal on old rag on the left. Um, this was an advisory we put up in 2019. We had a persistent food condition animal. We were able to haze that animal and eventually uh, it, we were able to drive that animal away and, and, and mitigate that situation. We use uh, advisory signs quite a bit. If we have uh, maybe a persistent animal or animal that bluff charges, uh, a, vis a visitor, a bluff charge is usually a defense, is, is typically a defensive response associated with an animal that's found a good food source. And then a hiker typically will scare that animal in thick vegetation and then it'll bluff, it'll bluff charge. Or sometimes a sow with cubs will bluff charge and it's, it's a defensive response. And additional measures, of course, food storage lockers we talked a bit about. And then bear poles in around our backcountry huts. Those are essential for making sure your backpack gets put up high so bears can't get to it. And just briefly talking a little bit about wildlife or excuse me, uh, bear vehicle collisions. Um, this map is a hotspot map that we um, we're looking at bear vehicle collisions from 2016 to 2019. And it really shows sort of the north and central districts um, that we see a lot of uh, bear vehicle collisions. And one of the hottest, hottest locations or sections is the area between um, Thornton Gap and Big Meadows. And you can see that right here, uh, Luray and below is, is what you can see where all those strikes happen. And then of course, the two highways that uh, bisect the park, uh, 211 and 33, there's a number of bear strikes along those as well due to the higher speeds and uh, that type of thing. North District has, has some strikes as well. Very. Not, not so many in South District, lower, lower visitation, better line of sight, um, less roadside animals. And of course, that hotspot mapping really helps us um, decide where to put um, wildlife collision signs. It could be bear collision, it could be deer collision signs. So it helps us prioritize and put signs in specific locations and move them around as needed as those situations change throughout the, throughout the season. And if all those prevention measures and mitigation measures fail, you know, we, we rely then on capturing and, 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 uh, and or trapping and then relocating the animal to a more remote area of the park, typically uh, remote areas in the South District, sometimes a remote area in the North District, typically that's 50 miles away. So you, you can ask, you often ask, what, what can we do? And a lot of these are intuitive and I believe a lot of you folks are already doing these types of things, but I thought I would add it. But basically we're talking about securing your trash day and night. And even as a homeowner, this is important. If you see trash bags that are left out, either clean it up or report it to a ranger. Um, same thing with coolers and food containers. Um, make sure they get put in your vehicle or a food storage locker. And then if you're willing, Help us by picking up loose trash and food scraps, candy wrappers. Use nitrile gloves. Use use gloves. That we're in a pandemic right now. If you just decide to do that, but uh, any help is appreciated. We have a lot of staff that pick up trash and pick up micro trash and and fruit rinds. It's amazing how much how much we find in picnic areas on weekends. 
Um, and if dumpsters are overflowing or not working properly, report it to a ranger. That's gets critical. And if you're in the back country, practice leave no, leave no trace. And, and uh, the principle respect wildlife is the one we're talking about there mostly and making sure you take your trash out. And then as far as dogs go, always make sure they're on a leash. Uh, dogs and sows plus cubs are really bad medicine. So um, that's, that's a whole nother talk, but um, we, we wanna make sure dogs are always kept on a leash. So that pretty much wraps it up. And I think we can perhaps take some questions. Sounds great. Yeah, we had one other question in our poll. Uh, we can just start with this one. What are the two months of the year that you're most likely to see a black bear in the park? We had 45% of you said April and May, and 34% of you said June and July. Those were the top two percentages. Uh, what's the answer, Ralph? It's, it's typically June and July. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? I think it's sort of the peak of the peak of the um, natural food season and animals are drawn to the road corridor to the skyline driver uh, corridor that's when berries are along the corridor so motorists will see uh, bears uh, more readily during that period of time but also on trails so I, I, I think it's just related to natural foods and the fact that animals are moving and they're also sort of in in close quarters with with humans with respect to their natural food sources. Great. So we had a couple questions come in before the event, and we'll do our best to get through them. So last summer, we saw a huge increase uh, by about 0.2 million visitors to the park last summer. Uh, more people visiting the backcountry. The question really is, how is your team responding to help protect visitors and wildlife even more? That's a good question. Um, it's relevant. And Last year, we really had to step up with um, trash pickup and securing bags. And we did that by, by finding additional volunteers and picking up an extra intern. So we had a couple, two or three extra staff that helped us with basically securing trash and food. And I, I think if we can get a, a, a real good handle on that, it really takes care of a lot of our problems. So. Last year, that was we were able to do that even with re reductions in some of our maintenance positions. We did it with some volunteers and interns, but um, we need to continue to do that this year. And I, I, it sounds like we may get some a, a little bit of additional help from the maintenance ranks, but really all divisions, <clears throat> all divisions help with with picking up trash and securing trash. It's great to hear. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on perceived risk? around black bears in Shenandoah or even on the East Coast, maybe compared to other Western national parks, maybe those up North, mm -hmm. Alaska. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Any other park too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Shenandoah is, you know, we sort of have this mid-Atlantic black bears. They're, they're typically pretty, fairly docile, fairly non-aggressive compared to black bears in Canada or, or Alaska. Um, they are so much more adapted to humans and human use areas that they sort of have this inherent natural fear. Um, animals do get food conditions. We do get problem animals, but they, they but you're not seeing, you're really not seeing predatory behavior very much. Now, a couple of situations down in the Smokies in that area in some national forest down there a few years back, but, but we've been pretty lucky in Shenandoah, but we also, I think, do a really good job of minimizing some of those those risks. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. That's great. So we had a couple folks who live in and around the park, uh, you know, that, that have seen bears out on their property. Um, we got a question um, that, you know, it gets well below freezing temperatures in the winter. Um, at what outside air temperatures do they typically go into hibernation? Yeah, so I'm not aware of a specific temperature, but denning, bears going to den is typically triggered by a shortage of food and lowering temperatures. So it's that combination. So as food resources dwindle into late, late fall, into winter, that's when they'll go to den. And they'll do that 
you know, in, in Shenandoah, especially at high elevations, um, typically in late November, early December, and then they'll come out of denning in usually early to mid-March. So it's, it's, it's more triggered by, by um, lack of food and, and, and temperature. Now, if, if food is available throughout the winter and, and perhaps temperatures aren't that cold, then animals may not den. And you see that, or we see that uh, in the valley or in the Piedmont. So that's not uncommon. You can have animals active uh, throughout, <clears throat> throughout the winter, or you can see shorter denning periods. Great. We have another question that came in. So uh, this particular bear, so the, the same uh, individual that's been coming around this winter seems healthy, but he rolls around in uh, the red cedar and other similar evergreen shrubs and trees. He seems to be really enjoying himself. Uh, and just wondering, is this normal behavior? Why is he doing that? Um, it's a good chance that that animal is scent marking uh, part of his territory, or he's simply scratching. Um, and I've also read that sometimes they'll do that when they want to shed their winter coat. So any of those three things could be going on there. Interesting. So we had a couple on here. Uh, is mange a problem? And what's being done about that? Yeah. We have seen mange in the, in the region and in the park in the last two years, more so than we have in, in previous years. Um, we have seen maybe seven to eight uh, suspected mange bears per uh, field season. However, mange is a native disease process and the National Park Service policy is if it's a native disease or an, a native organism, we do not interfere. So we pretty much let nature take its course when we're dealing with native disease processes. So as far as mitigations go for mange animals, suspected mange animals, um, that would be something more the state wildlife resources folks would, would do, but that's not typically something we would, we would do. So you alluded to this a little bit before, but will bears be deterred from backcountry campsites if dogs are present? I know this is maybe a bit of a longer answer, but how would you go about answering that one? Um, I think dogs can be a deterrent for bears. Um, it's, not, it's not one I would recommend in backcountry scenarios. I think being educated and being savvy in the backcountry and and perhaps carrying bear spray and knowing how to utilize bear spray. Um, those are probably better things to have. Uh, dogs are fine, but um, the thing I mentioned with dogs is dogs especially, well, they have an in inherent antagonism with bears over many, many years, but dogs and sows with cubs are especially a bad mix. So that's where we see uh, occasionally when we, when I say we, you know, incidents within North America, that's when animals sometimes, when, when sows will attack dogs, you'll see dogs being killed. Sometimes, uh, sometimes a bear, a sow will switch from the dog as the owner tries to break it up and then it'll switch to the owner and, 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 and maul a human. So that's when we really need to be careful with, with dogs. And it's, that's why it's so important that they should be on, leash, on leashes at all time. So in addition to uh, a citation, can you charge a penalty fee for failure, failure to store food properly? Or uh, would that be more funds for the park? How does that work? Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, we, we, we impound and then the people have to come back and get it. They get their notifi notification, they come back and get it. They get lectured and hopefully they don't do it again. If it's egregious, they can get cited. And then that, that amount, I forget what the amount is, $75 plus or minus, but, but I don't know about a penalty and maybe Pat can speak to that. Um, I don't know if other parks do that, honestly. Go ahead, Pat. Oh, okay, thanks Rolf. If you um, want to. No, the, the, uh, the tool would be a, a, a violation notice, um, as both alluded to, it'd be somewhere in that $75 range. Um, 
we could not collect any other money. And then those citation dollars do not stay in the park. Uh, um, they roll up through the Justice Department through that um, uh, process, but uh, uh, the citation would be the means to uh, creating a negative uh, impact on that person from uh, doing this again. Great, thanks, Pat. So a couple other ideas. Can you put rumble strips in the high incident areas to keep people from driving too fast? Um, it's, it's a possibility. I, they would have to be, um, you know, portable, I suppose. We, we have thought about electronic message boards, but they're expensive and they're, they're, they're trailer, you know, they're on a trailer so you can move them around. Um, but what do you, what do you think, Pat, about rumble strips or speed bumps? Tough. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to unmute and, and get my video work and roll. Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think it's something we should talk about. Um, I know there's been some traffic studies uh, that have looked at uh, devices that slow people down. And um, sometimes it can actually have a negative effect. So you slow down to go over the speed bumps and then you accelerate coming out of that. And then you may have increased speeds between those sort of devices. But it's definitely something to think about um, in these areas. And as Ralph said, if we could make figure out a portable way to do that and put them when we're when we're seeing a, a bear in a certain area to try to slow them down. So great idea. We'll, yeah. we'll give it some thought. I, I I will say that I've observed with those bear graphic signs with the with the bear illustration, I have seen people slow down just with I think the idea that maybe well I'll see a bear, and so. Um, I don't think you can get the same effect with deer. I think people are sort of tired of deer sign and, and then maybe not really coming to Shenandoah to see deer as much as bears. But uh, you do see people slow down with though, but what we're seeing, unfortunately, what we're seeing with some of those bear signs that the fancier signs, people steal them. Um, and it's not, it's not un, un unique. Uh, you know, somebody struggles with, with theft of their speed kills bear signs uh, all the time and they have to chain them to, to cinder blocks and everything else. So. That's something we haven't figured out quite yet. We need to figure out a better way to secure some of those um, wildlife collision signs. The, the, the ones that are more attractive are the ones with the illustrations, with, with the graphics. So we received a couple questions in the same vein, but when black bears leave the park boundaries, how far do they likely go? How, what's their range like? I think it depends by time of year and, and gender. Uh, young animals, yearlings that are being pushed from the sow from their moms in June and July, they could range 10 to 100 miles or more uh, trying to find their own uh, home range. But um, young females, much less, um, trying to find a niche somewhere could be 5, 10, 20 miles or less. So it, ver it very much varies. Males on, on uh, typically are going to range much, much farther than females, and their home ranges are much larger. We have another one, uh, just about bear cubs. When, about when do bears have their cubs? Uh, typically late January into February. Okay, we had another one with all the food sources, including blueberries at Big Meadows. Uh, why don't we usually see bears out in the, in the meadow in particular? Because it's because it's exposed and it's wide open, um, partly. Um, uh, a lot of those, a lot of those berries don't come to fruit till later in the season. A lot of the uh, huckleberry and blueberries don't, don't fruit until what, about August, September sometimes, or July, August rather. Um, you just don't see a lot during the middle of the day. You don't, but perhaps uh, during low light, there's there's much more. There's certainly more deer during low light in the meadow. So I think I think if folks are viewing wildlife it, during those low light periods, I think they're going to see more. So they just don't want to be in in those exposed areas uh, when it's broad daylight. If it's broad daylight, they're going to be in more secluded areas and foraging and flipping rocks and that kind of thing in wooded areas. My sense. 
Uh, we got a couple more questions in just a few more minutes. So are there certain times that we kind of answered that one? Um, are there bear poles at the AT shelters? There are. And at every AT shelter now, there is also a bear food storage locker. So you have both. And those food storage lockers have really helped us, I think, in terms of, um, you know, minimizing some of those food rewards and, and trash rewards that animals would have otherwise gotten. So I think we've seen, we've kind of turned the corner with some of the um, AT hut issues we've seen in the last five, 10 years. It's really helped us. Speaking about hiking the AT, um, we do have a lot of hikers out there. And one of our guests asked, um, you know, I hike with poles often solo and usually carry snacks and a camelback. Um, any tips for hikers uh, and bears that are out there while hiking, especially solo? Yeah, if you're solo hiking, um, I wouldn't carry really scented food, like don't carry a tuna fish sandwich, right? That's gonna be a big scent attractant. But if you're carrying normal stuff like granola and kind bars and stuff like that, that's fine, I think. Um, just again, just be educated, be savvy. Um, if you if you purchase bear spray, know how to use it and keep it in a, in a place where you can get it out and deploy it. So many times people have bear spray in their pack and they you know, fiddle with it and they can't get it quick enough. Make sure it's in the front of your person and you can get to it easily and you know how to deploy it, know how to use it. And you use it as a last resort. Um, portable air horns aren't a bad idea. Make yourself known to bears in thickets. If you're, if you're hiking on the AT on the Appalachian Trail and you're in a thicket and it's, and it's during, during berry season and you, know, you suspect there could be animals in there you can't see, make yourself known. Uh, you yell, sing, whatever you need to do, and then you won't startle that animal as likely. Um, that's when you get those bluff charges. You startle an animal uh, locked in on a food source and that's when, that's when they can bluff you and uh, that can be pretty frightening. And Rolf, we just have a couple more minutes, but I um, want to talk about the bear canisters. Um, and I know there's a number of, of, you know, people who visit the park, they probably see a number of different kinds of trash receptacles, um, but the bear canisters in particular, um, what's the need in the park? Are those everywhere? Are those at different campsites? Um, you mean the, the food help? storage lockers? The food storage lockers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the bear boxes. Yeah. They are pretty much at every AT hut, which is I think eight or nine in the park. And, and, and they're at about half of the campsites in all the campgrounds. So we purposely cited um, bear, bear proof food storage lockers in the most um, potentially problematic sites. So if it's a walk-in site and it's a longer distance for people to lug their food back, we made sure those sites always got lockers. If it's a site that gets a ton of use or it gets a site uh, gets used by motorcyclists, um, that's going to get a locker. So those high use problem uh, potentially problematic sites all are lockered up. Um, so that's that's kind of how we looked at it. But we want to get more lockers out there still. So usually when you're camping, you have a good shot at finding a site with a locker, unless it's like a high use weekend and you're coming in, um, you know, and there's only a few sites left. Great. What I'm going to do is, uh, thanks so much, Rolf. This is really informative. We do have a number of other questions. So what I might do is uh, pitch them over to Rolf after the event. Uh, maybe we can get some of those answered on our website, um, out to you all, and uh, because there's a lot of really great questions. Um, so thanks so much, Rolf. Uh, sure. What I want to do now, yeah, thank you so much. And what I want to do now is, uh, get Jessica back on here, as well as Pat, if you have any other thoughts, additions. And I'll go ahead and add Jessica to the spotlight too. All right. Just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. And if you want more information, um, you're welcome to head to our website at snptrust.org. And we will, uh, you can find out more information about the bear wear, the Bear and Human Interaction Program and more of the programs that we're funding to support the park. Um, thank you for attending and I'll kick it back over to Pat, but we are looking at hosting more of these 
types of events in the next couple of months. So we hope you will continue to join us and learn more. Pat. Thanks, Jessica. Rolf, great job. Um, as Thanks. always, your passion comes through. Um, I think, uh, you know, we just ask that all of you think about your behavior when you come into the park. I like to say there are no problem bears. There are just problem people um, because, uh, you know, the bears are just doing what they need to do. They're looking for food. Um, and then we get these interactions. Obviously the interactions are not something we wanna see. And so there are things that you all can do. Use your food locker, uh, you know, police your, your campsite, police your picnic area, ensure that you're storing your food properly. Um, these are all great things you can do. You can educate your friends and family that come up to the park and you can support the trust, obviously. They, they do a lot of great work for the park. And uh, so we appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And we hope you have a good evening.